feel particularly honored and humbled to be giving this lecture and would like to expressly acknowledge Emeritus Professor Ross Thorpe's sponsorship of it. It's a reflection of the commitment to social justice she's demonstrated throughout a long and distinguished career. <coughs> um, my lecture grows out of uh, <coughs> the recent research I've been doing, uh, which has culminated, among other things, in the recent uh, publication of the recent book on poverty in Australia, 40 years after the Poverty Commission. Um, the lecture expands on some of the art, um, the uh, findings and arguments <coughs> detailed in the book. Uh, the, the lecture falls into six um, separate parts. Um, I'm acutely aware as a lawyer that I, I may be confronting some scepticism from social scientists, social workers, economists, and political theorists in suggesting that law is centrally relevant to the uh, alleviation and ultimate elimination of poverty. Um, so part of my argument uh, is um, uh, an attempt to um, uh, uh, like emphasize the importance of seeing laws as, as integral to any attempt to address poverty in contemporary society. Um, it's not exclusively the domain of, of economics or politics, um, but uh, every institution in a society that is committed to the uh, elimination of poverty uh, needs to be responsive to it. If you think of the, the health system um, in a society committed to the elimination of poverty needs to offer uh, equal access to poor people to medical services, likewise the education system. And so too law, the legal system, needs to be responsive to uh, the needs of poor people if, it's, uh, if society as a whole is going to comprehensively address um, poverty. So that's my pitch, my defence, if you like, for um, for the law side of things. Um, the first part of the lecture um, attempts to locate the work of the Poverty Commission um, within the general historical trajectory of the idea of social justice. Uh, I want to argue how the law, the uh, law and poverty have um, have been identified as being anyway connected comparatively recently. Um, the connection is very much tied up with the appearance of the social sciences in the 19th century, building on progressive ideas that emerged in an embryonic form in the late 18th century. Uh, the second section of the paper looks at how these ideas of social justice were reflected in the transformation of the system of rights, um, the package of rights, if you like, as part of citizenship in the 20th century, um, following on uh, at least in the common law systems, from the growth of civil political rights, uh, so, sorry, civil rights in the 18th century and the emergence of universal political rights in the 19th century. Um, the third section looks at how the welfare state represents, um, um, if you like, the state form of this particular image of social rights. Um, and how the Poverty Commission represented a particular manifestation of that historical project. Um, I then look at the recommendations and achievements of the Commission, um, specifically the, um, the Law and Poverty um, recommendations and the implementation of those recommendations. Um, and then I look at the various ways in which the current landscape, 40 odd years on, um, has um, can be seen in some ways as a failure of uh, the achievement of many of those objectives, but, but also that there are many um, very valuable achievements that flow directly from the recommendations of the Poverty Commission, which, uh, which we need to build on. And finally, I'll just identify some uh, contemporary policies and specifically law reforms that I think would uh, significantly advance the aims of the Poverty Commission, and which importantly I think are um, eminently uh, achievable, politically achievable, um, in the, even in the current climate. Okay, so just the, the general background to the Poverty Commission. As you probably know, it was first established by the McMahon government in 1972 um, with Ronald Henderson, Professor Ronald Henderson as the sole commissioner. It 
it's largely the result of agitation from church representatives and um, big welfare bodies. Uh, it's sort of a general review of the Australian welfare system. Um, so after 30 years, close to 30 years of post-war um, economic growth and boom, um, many people recognised that the benefits of that boom were not being adequately um, distributed. So um, lots of people missing out, significant levels of poverty. So Henderson's focus was very much on measuring the levels of income necessary for in individuals and families to avoid poverty and correspondingly calculating the extent of poverty across the entirety of Australia and specifically the pockets of poverty and identifying specific um, vulnerable groups. Um, his work has been enormously influential as the term the Henderson Poverty Mine um, uh, reflects. It's, it's formed part of the general policy discussions about poverty ever since. Um, and consistent with its terms of reference, the ensuing report, the first main report of the Public Commission, uh, contained detailed proposals for income support programs to lift various disadvantaged groups out of poverty. Um, but for all the work, the valuable work of the report represented, uh, a number of critics felt that it didn't go far enough. Um, it was considered to have not delved deeply enough into the causes of poverty and did not examine broader social policies to eliminate the structural causes of poverty. And these criticisms surfaced at the government level upon the election of the Whitlam government um, in 1972 to kind of coincide with the establishment of the, um, the, the Poverty Commission. Um, and the Whitlam government immediately proceeded to broaden um, the inquiries um, of the Poverty Commission. So they initiated an inquiry into compensation and rehabilitation, uh, an inquiry into the taxation system, uh, and also finally uh, an inquiry into the legal system and uh, the various laws that uh, were seen to cause or exacerbate poverty. Um, now it's important to see these various inquiries, and particularly the law and poverty inquiry, as collective expressions of social justice aspirations. Um, uh, they were at odds with uh, many of the kind of prevailing um, common sense notions of uh, what caused poverty at the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's worth dwelling a little bit on on the, the kind of the philosophy that flows through the, um, the first main report, Henderson report, and then the Sackville report, and uh, follows it. Uh, and what I've just uh, done in a, in a kind of a very rough form is, is just um, um, I tend to pr present, if you like, a typology. There's nothing original about it. It builds basically on the work of uh, citizenship, theories of citizenship of T.H. Marshall, and also of the, uh, the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, um, where they try to map out the, the origin of um, the origins of notions of social justice on the one hand, and how those ideas of social justice get represented institutionally, both in, in the forms of law, but also in the type of state which is associated with these if you like, these layers of rights. And particularly T.H. Marshall, he focuses on the British uh, um, history, and, uh, but the, his typology makes a lot of sense for most um, uh, advanced industrialized societies. So typically, um, society, particularly the British example, civil rights in the form of rights to participate in economic activity available to all, um, start to become established in the 18th century. Different time frames for other advanced um, countries, but typically uh, the civil economic rights precede political rights, um, and they are associated with liberal, li liberal philosophy, um, and the idea, dominant ideal of justice, which underpins them is this idea of equality, that uh, individuals are formally equal, so there should be no formal barriers to participate, 
participation on the part of any individual to, in, in, in economic activity. So we have the classic um, legal forms of contract and property developed at that time. Next stage, of course, is the, the, the notion of universal political rights, which emerged with the great reform movements of the 19th century. Um, again, it's a democratic state that reflects this type of notion of rights and the, again, the ideal of justice which underpins this right is a notion of formal equality. Um, but for T.H. Marshall and also for Habermas, that in the 20th century something different happens. And basically the, the thing different that happens is this notion of social justice becomes institutionalized. It's an idea that emerges really in the in embryonic form of the 18th century in the work of Adam Smith, but then more in a more kind of robust and developed form in the, the political writings of Thomas Paine and the uh, um, French writer Condorcet. Um, the, this idea that society, that justice is not a question of individuals um, doing right as between individuals, but Society is subject to an obligation to individuals, so that um, the uh, um, justice has, if you like, a collective dimension to it. That's the, es the essence of social justice. But that only is only meaningful, the notion of social justice, uh, if a number of preconditions um, are possible. Um, uh, and there are basically three, th three elements to it. And the, um, the first element is that the, that needs to be a clear idea of a bounded society with a determinate membership. Um, because unless there is a, 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 an identifiable society, there isn't, if you like, a capacity for agency or a res pinning responsibility for justice. Um, the, the second requirement for the concept of social justice is a set of determinist institutions that can be called upon, can be summoned to bring social justice into effect. <coughs> and th the third requirement is that there be sp specific agencies of the state which have the capacity to um, give effect to social rights to the extent to which the state is subject to an obligation of duty to its citizens. Um, the citizens in turn have rights to call upon the state to, to implement them. And so the, and the ideal of justice uh, that underpins social rights is, is ultimately a notion of substantive equality that citizens, by virtue of their membership of a particular political community, have a right to a certain minimum level of, um, of material and emotional um, well-being. Um, so that, that, um, that set of ideas um, swirling around um, political movements in the course of the 20th century come to take uh, institutional form. They become political parties, uh, develop social democratic parties, um, uh, take on these ideas and through political movements, transform the state. And you can see, in a sense, the Henderson Report as a manifestation of that, of that movement. And Australia, within, for theorists of the welfare state, Australia is a kind of a laggard in, uh, state. It lags behind <coughs> others. The comparable um, documents to the Henderson Report in the UK, for example, is the Beveridge Report, which takes place 30 years earlier. Um, so Australia's welfare state is comparatively underdeveloped by comparison to the European states, and particularly the Nor Northern European social democracies. Um, but to the extent to which the Henderson and Sackville reports represent this kind of thinking, they're important moments in the history of the de development of the Australian uh, welfare state. And uh, the, particularly important because they were effective. Um, there's a remarkable level of um, um, ad advance. Sometimes hard to see that these days. I want to look at some of the data, current data in a minute, but um, it, the, the, both reports were remarkably successful in, uh, in uh, advancing a whole array of social policies.